there was a presence of a snake there. The reason that no one got injured or hurt was in fact that there was a good spirit there, the, the rainbow serpent. Could this be proof of the existence of the elusive monster of Lake Van? Certainly the man who shot this footage thinks so. We thought it's just an accidental attack, but we kept on receiving information that more and more child are being attacked. Is there a monster in Turkey's Lake Van? And have India's wolves turned to baby killers? Animal X investigates the weird world of animal mystery. First, we head to Australia, home to the intriguing rainbow serpent. Andrew White and his wife Liz had an ambitious dream, to dive in one of Australia's driest and most inhospitable deserts. There is water out here, lots of it, but you have to go deep into the largest underground water system in the world. Animal X travelled to outback Western Australia to the Nullarbor Plain to relive an incredible tale of survival, one linked to an ancient mythical creature. Nullarbor is basically you know, a large featureless plain and it's dotted by these large sinkholes and they were the things that we were mostly interested in because they led to the water table some hundred metres below the Earth's surface. Cave diving is not safe. Lots of things can happen. It can be a hazardous dive, even for experienced divers like Andrew and Liz, makers of the internationally acclaimed Quest and Deep Probe Dive documentary series. But as they and the team prepared, they had no way of knowing that their fate would be decided by a creature from the dream time, an Aboriginal myth, the Rainbow Serpent. The Rainbow Serpent is common across Indigenous Australia, and there is a different name for it in every language. But ultimately, the symbolism is the same. It symbolizes the creative and the destructive power of nature. The Aboriginal tribes of this area are closely tied to this land. Land is spiritual to them. It has personality. It must be respected. The Rainbow Serpent is a mysterious force to be reckoned with. We had some of the tribal elders with us on the expedition and they did venture out with us to basically give us the OK to, to, to go diving on their land. The caves had particular significance. To them, they were part of the beginning of life itself, and the Rainbow Serpent was an inextricable part of the legend. A star uh, fell from the heavens and hit the Nullarbor Plain and bounced into the ocean, and then from that emerged two spirit people. And as they swam towards the cliffs, they found some entrances to caves, which they swam through, and then they emerged on the land as man and woman. And so that was their way of explaining uh, the creation of their people that lived in that area. They'd all noticed something unusual on the way in. A strange snake, brown and green, about a metre and a half long. If they'd realised its true significance, the expedition would have gone no further. We had one of the tribal elders uh, with us on the expedition, and prior to starting the diving, uh, she felt a very strong spiritual presence and we offered for her to come down and there was no way on earth that we were going to get her into the cave because to her not only did it have some spiritual significance but there were spirits down there and we didn't think of anything of it at the time because we were there to explore this thing and most of uh, the things that we were doing were scientific in nature and to us it was just a dreaming story. Snakes are often seen as messengers of the rainbow serpent and of course, snakes live underground, in holes, in cracks in the rock, in places associated with the underworld and all that's associated with the underworld. So that to come across a prominent snake at the beginning of an expedition could be interpreted as a warning to be careful. After almost a month of diving, the expedition came to the end of the tunnel, blocked by a massive rockfall but they'd swum nearly five kilometres into the earth, a major achievement. The team gathered in the base camp cavern to remove nearly two tonnes of gear. 
As they started to work, the rainbow serpent struck in a way that was totally unexpected. On the surface, a gigantic storm suddenly appeared. The storm broke with frightening intensity. A hundred million liters of water gushed through the caves onto the team far below. Without warning, the cave system collapsed. In the blackness, millions of tons of rock fell into the tunnels, trapping 13 team members, including Andrew. The, the cave collapse was totally unexpected, and it turned from a small trickle to just a cascading torrent. And as that happened, boulders and our equipment started charging down into the cave. The ledge that we were on moved, and all the rigging broke away. And it was obvious that whoever was below us was going to get killed just from boulders and, and water and debris going down into the cave. And I really thought that was going to be my last day on Earth. And it got to a point where the water started to subside enough that we made a decision. We said, well, if we stay here, we're probably going to die. If we go, we may get injured or, or get killed, but it's worth the risk. The rock was highly unstable, boulders weighing several tons, precariously balanced on mud and debris. But one by one, the team came to the surface. It was a miraculous escape. But for a local Aboriginal elder, there was more to it. He said to us, and it was rather curious at the time, there wasn't a snake there by any chance. And we said, well, a matter of fact, there was. All the time that we'd been going in and out of the cave on that last day, there was a presence of a snake there. Well, at that point, you could sort of feel the hair coming up on the back of your neck. But he said, the reason that no one got injured or hurt it was in fact that there was a good spirit there, the, the rainbow serpent, and there was the physical presence of the snake. We were being prevented from seeing any more. That's why the, the spirits collapsed the cave and it made sure that we got out. The Aboriginal rainbow serpent remains a myth. A symbol from an ancient culture difficult to understand. But to the Aborigines of the Nullarbor Plains, the rainbow serpent is among them, guiding their spiritual path and protecting their land. Just as there have been many reported encounters with Australia's rainbow serpent, there have been hordes of documented sightings of a monster in Turkey's Lake Van. In this case, though, some claim to have pictures to prove it. Beneath these shining waters, it's said there lurks a creature unlike any other. Huge and mysterious, it haunts the depths of the world's biggest saltwater lake, rarely breaking the surface. The people here in this remote Turkish village believe there's a monster in Lake Van. This man says he saw what he thought was the monster's back. When the creature dived underwater, it revealed a large tail. According to this eyewitness, the monster is about 15 meters long with humps along its back. Animal X traveled far into eastern Turkey to the vast expanse of Lake Van, the fourth biggest lake in the world. The people of this ancient region are convinced that Van is home to a creature beyond the comprehension of science. A creature that may have even been sighted in centuries gone by and immortalized in stone on the walls of this thousand-year-old church. Local fishermen are among those who've witnessed the monster. Hassan Molooglu says he saw it about 35 years ago. He was coming to work one morning when he noticed something out on the lake, about 150 meters away. He says the strange creature was moving through the water. Before the sighting, this fisherman was like many others here, believing the monster existed only in folklore. Now there's new evidence that there's not only the locals, but the whole world talking about Turkey's lake monster. Could this be proof of the existence of the elusive monster of Lake Van? Certainly the man who shot this footage thinks so. He's a teaching assistant at Van University and has been studying the creature for many years. 
Bunel Kozak says he set up his camera at a well-known location where the monster has been seen before. He waited there and eventually got more than he'd bargained for, as the creature appeared not just once, but three times. As part of his intense research, Unal says he's interviewed at least a thousand people who claim to have had a sighting of the lake monster. And he admits over the years, his quest to find it has become somewhat of an obsession. But the 26-year-old is not the only person who claims to have captured moving images of the creature. Nesimi Didi says he was walking along the lake's edge, taking shots with his video camera, when he noticed something moving out in the water. He says it was only by chance that he was able to film it. He says it moved along the lake, eventually ending up near an island, the island of Akdamar. Astonished by what he was witnessing, Nesimi recorded these images of the monster, apparently swimming near the surface of the lake. He says it only disappeared from view when a plane flew overhead. What makes the existence of such a creature even more extraordinary is how it manages to live here at all. You see, Lake Van is so salty, there are very few fish that can survive. Dr. Osman Çetinkaya is the head of the Turkish Fisheries Department. He says only one type of fish and various plankton have been found in Lake Van. Tests with rainbow trout showed that they only survived for 15 minutes when released into the water. But he admits that when it comes to the lake monster, no scientific research has been conducted to see whether or not there is such a life form. He says the main reason is that there isn't the right equipment, and as well there is no researcher in Turkey experienced enough to do the job. There's little sign of the legendary lake monster losing any of its appeal, as people from all walks of life clamor to explain its mysterious appearances. Is it some type of fish monster, a breed never before recorded in science? Could it be an apparition caused by shadows on the lake? Or is the monster simply the work of charlatans, a clever hoax? As long as the rumors persist that something is lurking in these remote waters, the people of Van will be watching, hoping for another sign that out there in the black depths swims the monster of the lake. From unexplained monsters of the deep to those that stalk the land. After the break, Animal X investigates whether wolf men or wolf packs are on the prowl for children in India. 76 children were attacked, 45 of them killed and eaten, and 31 left wounded. It's its record in 20th century anywhere in the world. Welcome back to Animal X. In childhood, big bad wolves are something we imagine in fairy stories, like Little Red Riding Hood and the Three Little Pigs. But in India, there's a real fear of these cunning predators after an astonishing number of child killings. But just what's out there, a wolf pack or wolf men? In northern India, nightfall brings with it a certain terror. All ears are tuned for the sounds of hungry predators in search of young, vulnerable victims. A killer wolf pack that so far has been blamed for attacking more than 70 children. Animal X traveled to the impoverished district of Ray Bareli in the state of Uttar Pradesh to investigate the incredible reports of man-eating wolves. It's a story that's made headlines around the world and has grown bigger in the telling. Now entire villages are barricading their doors against these so-called devils of the night.
initially we thought it's just an accidental attack but kept we kept on receiving information that more and more child are being attacked Dr. Ram Lakam Singh says the first attack occurred in March 1996. Most of the victims had been between one and three years of age, although the wolves have gone for older children too. Some mothers claim their babies were snatched right out of their laps and dragged off into the night. 76 children were attacked, 45 of them killed and eaten, and 31 left wounded. It's, it's a record in 20th century anywhere in the world. 11-year-old Sumitra Singh is one of the lucky ones, a survivor of this terrifying phenomenon. Her frightening ordeal happened one hot August night at 2 a.m. The family had moved outside to sleep because of the heat. Little did they know their daughter would now become easy prey. No one heard the wolf approach. It was only when Sumitra screamed that her parents and grandmother flew into a panic. The animal grabbed her once, dropped her, then grabbed her again. Her father eventually managed to scare it off into the forest. For the rest of her life, Sumitra will carry a stark reminder of her brush with death, teeth marks made by a fierce predator who left still hungry. Mysteriously, Sumitra wasn't the only person to be attacked that night. In a village just a few kilometers away, two wolves had gone on another feeding frenzy. Sarjo Devi says she learned of the attack at a hospital where Sumitra was being treated. She spoke to a father whose daughter had been mauled to death by wolves. He had the baby's head with him. This is the man she met at the hospital, Mohammed Ishmael, father of two-year-old Ruxana. He has vivid memories of the shocking event. It also happened outside while the family were sleeping. Mohammed says he saw two wolves in the bush after the attack. The one that had snatched his daughter was moving slowly. The other was further ahead. Despite a frantic search soon after the baby was taken, nothing was found. The situation changed, though, in the morning. Mohammed says the search party spread out to cover more ground to look for the killers as well as his child. At 6.30, they made a horrific discovery. They found the lower half of the baby's body. Further on, they found the baby's head. Her torso was missing. For Ruxana's grandmother, the memory of that night is an extremely painful one. She was there when her granddaughter was snatched from her bed and remembers how helpless everyone felt when they could not stop the wolves from taking her. Now, families have been told to take precautions not to leave children outside after dark. Villagers have also organized groups of night watchmen so that someone can always be on the lookout for stalking wolves. The reality of it all is that locals here have virtually become prisoners in their own homes after nightfall. For some, though, the warnings have come too late. Badrunisha Ishmael says, of course, people have changed their ways, but nothing will bring back her only granddaughter. The government, meanwhile, has set up teams of wolf catchers. Every night, the hunters search for any signs of the wayward predators, and if they find them, they shoot to kill. To coax the wolves out into the open, team members have tried everything from playing a tape recording of a crying child to using live bait. But more often than not, they're outwitted by the cunning animals. So why have the wolves of India turned to man-eaters? Ironically, they're classified as an endangered species here. And since changes were made to conservation laws in the 1980s, their numbers have increased up to four times in some areas. The government is now accused of making a goodwill gesture that's gone disastrously wrong. This official says the other problem is that over time, the wolves' natural habitat has decreased due to cultivation. In desperation, they've been forced to look for other sources of food. As people move in, their children become an easy target, and so the attacks occur. Local shepherds in particular have come in for criticism, accused of blatantly moving their flocks closer to the wolves' natural environment.
With the situation at crisis point, the government has waived its conservation laws allowing people to kill dangerous wolves in self-defense. Villagers are told to shoot at it with a rifle or hit it over the head or spine. Such incredible stories of invincible beasts snatching children have led to rumors that it may not be the work of a wolf pack, but of wolf men. While it's standing and leaping, its height almost becomes five, six feet. Certainly in ancient folklore, there have been many bizarre tales of wolf men eating and attacking children. In India, some people's fear has turned to hysteria. This elderly resident says he certainly doesn't think the baby snatching is the work of a wolf. After all, he says, wolves are shy creatures and they wouldn't have the courage to do such a thing. He says word is needlessly being put around that a wolf is responsible, but in reality, it's a different story. So, could there be wolf men lurking in their midst? Those who believe in the werewolf theory claim to have seen a creature with superhuman powers capable of changing its form. And stopping the rumors has proved all but impossible, despite official announcements that the wolves are definitely not human. Those who've grown tired of waiting for the wolf catchers to get lucky have taken the law into their own hands. Several people have been attacked by lynch mobs for supposedly being the wolves in disguise, and the villagers' primeval fears, fueled by superstition, have led to the deaths of three men, one of them incinerated in a vehicle. Wolf men? or wolf pack. Whatever the locals' beliefs, there appears to be no easy solution to the problem. With the government sticking to its plans to make wolves an endangered species, their numbers will continue to increase just as northern India's population continues to grow, as civilization creeps a little further into the wolves' natural habitat. The baby snatchers may well be around for some time yet. It said there are stranger things in heaven and earth than we can think of. Ultimately, the symbolism is the same. It symbolizes the creative and the destructive power of nature. While it's standing and leaping, its height almost becomes five, six feet. You've just seen some of them on Animal X.